Today's video is going to feature one of my homemade amps. In this case, it's based on the one of the very earliest of all the Princeton chassis, uh, the 5F2A chassis, which was single-ended. Uh, this was very early in the evolution of the Princeton amplifier, and in effect, it is a champ with a tone control. Uh, I'll review some of the schematics of the champ, and you'll see how the Princeton evolved from it. If all this sounds interesting, I want you to pull up your easy chair, get your popcorn, and prepare for today's video. Well, let's uh, begin our tour of the mighty Danasonic Fender Princeton clone uh, by taking a look at the outside. I use the kind of a medium brown lizard material and the fretwork across the speaker opening that's reminiscent of the old uh, National Dobro. Uh, speakers and uh, I just I like it it's kind of a nostalgic look uh, this is that grill cloth that I've been touting so highly that's used for deck chairs and chaise lounges it's dynamite stuff in this case uh, it's kind of a gold a pale gold weave which I thought went nicely with the brown leather the cabinet is of identical grain lizard grain uh, I guess it's a vinyl or naugahyde material uh, in a contrasting color of black, of course, obviously. And then I used a brown handle to match the front. Here's the back of the amp. I tried to keep it real simple. This is a very small cabinet. Uh, I'm going to say probably 14 or 15 inches square. It weighs about 20 pounds, uh, which is rather heavy, but that's because of the speaker and the fairly stout transformers that I used. Uh, I used an aluminum for the chassis and I didn't label the controls because let's face it if you don't know that that's a toggle switch and that's a pilot light and this is going to be the volume first and then the tone and two inputs well then you have no business fooling around with amplifiers that's the way I look at it also I was too lazy um, see the tube set up here uh, nice brand new uh, power transformer with the flux band. I'm going to pull the back off this one and get a better look, but I adhered to my principles of having a ventilation for the tubes and transformers up here at the top. I got a little bit of a back to resonate with the speaker, and then I got my little handhold down here where I can reach in and drag out my cord uh, to plug it in. Well, here we are with the back off the amp. Uh, the construction is my usual uh, finger jointed three quarter inch pine. Um, the, I, for the back door and the speaker baffle, I use a fairly high grade of birch half inch plywood. Uh, people have asked me, well, do you use particle board in your amps? And I said, well, do you ever use a soup spoon to scoop out your eyes? Um, it's about as likely, okay? I really have no use for particle board. As far as I'm concerned, it isn't even very good kindling. Okay, that said, let's get back here to the amplifier. Okay, enough ranting. Let's take a look at the uh, chassis. Got the uh, fairly husky uh, power transformer here with the uh, uh, copper flux band. The um, fuse, of course, the 5Y3 rectifier, and uh, the shielded 12AX7 uh, preamp tube. This uh, you'll see is the plug for the speaker. Now I have a 4 ohm outlet and an 8 ohm outlet. I do this. I get the double output transformer um, for most of the amps I make because this way if I have a 4 ohm speaker cabinet or something like that I can plug it in here and power it or I can plug in here for the normal 8 ohm. Okay we've got the output transformer in the back and then the single-ended 6V6 uh, output tube. Most people don't realize that at one time Fender Princeton's just were single-ended and this is, I'll show you the schematic uh, so you don't think I'm hallucinating, uh, we'll take a look at it. Now the best part of this I think is the speaker and I told this story uh, once before on a, it was at a video posted on a different site but uh, as you look at this, at 220 is a Jensen, 1966, and the 36th week. You could not ask for a better speaker. This is a C10N Jensen speaker. 
completely original, original cone, everything about it just sweet as can be. But the way I got it is what is the story that, that makes it all even better. I went to a guy's house to look at some speakers he had for sale. This was the first one he pulled out of the pile. Uh, and I almost fainted because it's exactly what I was looking for. He takes one look at it and there's a tiny, and I mean tiny, little tear, not in the edge of the uh, cone, but down, you know, about halfway down to where the voice coil is, that can easily be patched. It's uh, totally inconsequential. But he looked at that and got so disgusted, he ran out his back door and threw this speaker into his big garbage pail. I ran after him, naturally, and trying to act sort of cool for fear that he'd uh, start to come to some realization of what a fantastic speaker this was, and charge me accordingly, I asked for permission to climb into his trash pail to retrieve it, and so I climbed in, being as cool as you can when you're climbing into a stinking old trash pail, but I dragged this jewel out, and it landed, thank God, magnet side down. So there was no harm. Uh, the cone, everything came out unscathed. Uh, I put it in my truck and with you know trembling hands, and it's now safely ensconced exactly where it needs to be in my little cabinet of my uh, Fender Princeton clone. Okay, I removed the two screws that hold the chassis into the cabinet. And uh, before I do pull out the chassis, I'm going to discuss another one of my pet peeves about commercial amplifiers. I think you've all been through this. There's usually a bunch of screws, more than you would expect, that are holding the amplifier into the cabinet. And as you unscrew them, the amplifier starts to drop, okay, just fall down. So you're holding it with one hand, trembling from the weight, while the, uh, you're undoing all these screws to try to get this chassis out. Well, I found a whole lot better way to do it. Now it's kind of hard to see, but in every case I support my chassis on both sides with wooden runners like this. One on this side, and it's real hard to see, but it's back in there beside the transformer. Now in my amps, uh, the chassis is really a drawer that is self-supported by the cabinet. It's like pulling out the drawer to put on your socks in the morning. Okay, except in this case you've got a bunch of electrolytic capacitors in your sock drawer. Speaking of which, you notice that they're isolated at the rear uh, away from everything. We've got the power supply over here on the left with the 5Y3. We've got the uh, 12 uh, AX7 preamp tube here. We've got the output jacks on either side. One thing that I thought was a nice touch is, and I got this from the old national amps, is uh, shielding the uh, input jacks from the electronics. Okay, this is the uh, 6V6 right here, and it's awful close. So I thought this shield couldn't hurt. And sure enough, this amp is absolutely dead quiet. You notice I use point-to-point -point wiring with terminal strips. I don't do the black cardboard with the eyelets. Um, I just have never been interested in doing that. I'm sure it's wonderful and it's true to form for the old vintage uh, Fender amps, but it's just never appealed to me. One other thing, I'm going to make a suggestion to you. If you use aluminum, and it's a great chassis material because it's a big heat sink and it conducts better than steel, conducts heat and electricity better than steel. And that is, don't try to bend a piece into an L. You're better off if you make your amp chassis out of two flat plates and then bolt them together using a piece of like this L angle uh, channel in here. Uh, you bolt it the front and you bolt the bottom to the L channel and strong as can be and a beautiful sharp right angle. Uh, try bending aluminum sometime if you really want an exercise in frustration. Even with heat you're going to get a kind of a sweeping curve with a bunch of fracture marks and it's not pretty and it can't slide in. When I do this drawer in this has to be a perfect right angle for a tall line upright. Okay, a couple, there was just a couple tips. Uh, let's slide this back in and button it up. Okay, here we are all buttoned up. Now, uh, one other thing, I've been uh, asked a bunch of times, uh, what is the technique for upholstering a cabinet like this? And I'm going to make a video uh, where I show my method, because it, it really does seem to work. Uh, this amp, I've had this for months and months, it's been subject to heat and everything else, and uh, it's holding up real well. So I will do a video on the best methods and materials 
to do upholstery work like this. Now I'm going to give you a clue. If you try to use that 3M Super 77 spray glue, uh, you're in trouble. You're going to end up having to redo it. That stuff just doesn't cut it when it comes to upholstering cabinets. I know that's blasphemy because that's what everybody tries to use. But uh, the way to do them is actually a little more difficult. It takes a little more time, but it sure works. Before we take a look at the, some schematics, I wanted to show you uh, the design process that goes into one of these amps. Uh, the way I build them, uh, the speaker, I draw a scale drawing of the speaker and then construct everything around it because it's really the predominant structure. The, the one thing you can't change is the speaker. You can change everything else. So I draw it and then uh, I make, and I just have a deal where I like the cabinet to be as small as possible. So as you can see, I created the cabinet with a slide-in drawer chassis here. And, uh, the transformer, of course, has to clear the magnet. You have the tubes have to clear. All of that are considerations, little details about how the drawer is going to work. I might uh, do at the side. That was my idea for the grill uh, in the beginning, crude as it may look, but that's how it ended up. So um, this is the way, if you want to design and build your own amp from scratch, I really suggest you use this method. Uh, pick out your speaker first and then make the cabinet, build it around the speaker. Okay, I just can't resist uh, reviewing briefly the history of the Fender Champ and how it turned into the Princeton. Uh, this is the schematic for the very first Fender Champ, and as you can see, this is as simple as it gets. It uses a Pento, a 6SJ7, as the uh, preamp tube to a 6V6 with a simple volume control here, output to the speaker, 5Y3 rectifier, uh, this is probably, well, this was the basis for probably, I don't know, like a quarter of all the amplifiers made uh, over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, it's just utter simplicity and it works wonderfully. And it really sounds good. Okay, that's a strange combination. When you can have something super simple, cheap and easy to make and it works great, I don't know what the downside is, but that's why this thing is so famous and uh, had such a tremendous impact on the amplifier industry. Now around 1955 the 12AX7 tube was developed and uh, they just, Fender, even though they had a good thing going with a 6SJ7, they just couldn't overlook this. This is a fantastic tube. I mean it's probably the most commonly used amplifier tube of all and uh, they adopted it. Uh, this would have been around 55. Okay, they split, you know, that the 12X7 is really like two tubes in one envelope. Uh, they use, this is the uh, first stage of amplification. They go through the volume control to the second stage of amplification, then they go to the 6V6. So you end up with a little stronger signal, a little more, uh, let's say, a little probably better fidelity with a 12X7, although the old pentodes have a great tone. Uh, this is a little more accurate, probably, but that's it, okay? Uh, other than the change of that preamp tube, everything else is pretty much the same. Which leads us to the first Princeton uh, amplifier that uh, Fender ever made. It's a Model 5 F2A. Okay, this is the, the mother of all Princeton amps. Um, it's very simple, you notice single ended with a 6V6, but it is more complex than the champ that it came from. Now let's look at the changes. First of all, um, they did use a 12AX7 and split in half and with the volume in between the two sections, but they also added a tone control. It's utter simplicity, like everything to do with the champ. 0.0005 microfarads on one side of the tone control, 0.005 to ground on the other, and it works like a charm. It's a fabulous tone control. So I've even used this whole circuit here with the tone and volume control in other amplifiers and been very pleased. A couple things they changed. They cathode biased the 12AX7, they added an extra filter capacitor and they added the tone control. Other than that, it's pretty much like uh, the champ before it. 
Now, I added a couple uh, little changes here. I put in, in my output transformer, I used the one that can uh, output to either 4 or 8 ohm. I put a 1K uh, grid stopper resistor right here on the way into the grid of the 6V6. Uh, other than that, uh, not, not many changes. But uh, we uh, now will see how this circuit works. I think you'll be impressed. The tone control is a nice little plus. And uh, let's see what you think. Okay, here's a little Princeton all buttoned up, plugged in, and ready to go. Uh, let's play a couple simple tunes here to give you an idea how it sounds. That's about it for this video featuring my homemade Princeton 5F2A amp. I hope you enjoyed it uh, and I hope you'll stay tuned for future videos. I really appreciate your time and interest. Thanks.